Welcome to Freedom to Know Wellness, a disability advocacy platform to hold space and give voice to those with complex medical and chronic pain conditions, female reproductive challenges and miscarriages, and address other disability related topics. We will dive into how these medical conditions affect individuals' mental health and the challenges they face maneuvering through the Canadian medical, employment and disability system. Our goal at Freedom to Know Wellness is to connect and bridge the gap between patients and the medical and holistic community in which they seek treatment. I am your host, Michelle Samuels. Today on Freedom to Know Wellness, we will hear about one woman's journey with uterine fibroids and the international doctors and services that saved her life. We will also discuss her current treatments and her life managing uterine fibroids. Today's discussion will cover various topics around uterine fibroids, including the racial disparity in uterine fibroids cases found in black and brown women. The woman speaking today is Dr. Nkem Kalu. Now, please note, Dr. Kalu is not a medical doctor, but in her own research, and of course, from her personal experience, she advocates the importance of further research on uterine fibroids. But before we start, let's provide some context on uterine fibroids. In Canada, 40% of women between the ages of 20 and 50 have uterine fibroids. They can range from being asymptomatic to causing depredation on the female reproductive system. An interesting fact, within that 40%, there is a high percentage of racial disparity in women suffering from uterine fibroids. Almost 25% of Black women between ages 18 and 30 have fibroids, compared to about 6% of white women of the same age. And by age 35, 60% of Black women will have uterine fibroids. Additionally, East Indian women were second in this percentage behind Black women burdened with this disease, according to the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology Canada. I find the word disease appropriately describes how uterine fibroids for many women experiencing them. I would even call it an endemic disease in women of African diaspora. But we will address this a little later in the interview. Today's interview is in two parts. Part one is the initial interview and part two is a Q&A follow-up with questions pertaining to what was discussed and disclosing more personal information about Dr. Callow's experience pre and post surgery. See part two in the link description below. Please note in this interview, I made a comment about my friend getting hepatitis B 10 years ago. It was actually 25 years ago, but the memory of what she went through seemed closer. Please advise, the information provided in this episode is from the opinions of the interviewee and interviewer. For further medical advice, please contact your practitioner. Now, let's begin the interview. On today's episode, I would like to welcome an, an amazing woman, and I would call her a fibroid warrior herself. Um, welcome to the Freedom to Know Wellness platform, Dr. Nkem Kalu. Thank you. How are you doing nice today? To be here. Doing good. Good, <laughs> good. So can you tell us, listeners, you know, just a little bit about yourself, your background? Sure. Um, the long story, which I'll give you the short story. <laughs> uh, born and raised, I guess, born in Nigeria, raised in Nigeria and mm -hmm. Zambia, and then also spent a considerable amount of my youth in the U.S. before moving back to Nigeria. And now I am a new Canadian um, living in Toronto. And what's your, how's your experience been so far in regards to living in Toronto? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think I have totally become a Toronto person. I can mm. figure out where people are from. Um, very quickly from, from yeah, I just need two lines and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Jane and Finch. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe from Scarborough, what have or like, you. Or yeah. the beaches, you, can, yeah. you know, you start yeah. to, Orangeville really stands out. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah, and guys from Burlington, I think there's, there's a certain way that they just kind of carry themselves. I'm like, yeah, I, I can see it. Okay. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, it's been, a, I think, the first opportunity in my life to really come into my own and um, in many ways, independent of um, the previous chapters in my life, just kind of build my own story. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a terrifying and exciting adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So what is your profession? Because I know you have um, the prefix doctor on your name, so. Uh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a doctorate degree in political science and um, a master's degree in international business. Uh, essentially, I just my my job and my passion is to help people be more awesome at the things that they do. Um, so I've worked across different sectors of life and in different industries. Some of my favorite jobs included working uh, with the football department at my old university, um, especially on the recruiting end because you get to see talent come through. And um, I think just really understanding the the relevance and the purpose behind your job made it mm -hmm. so exciting. Um, these kids that we were bringing to middle of nowhere in Nebraska for, wow. for football scholarships, just that decision alone uh, could be what kept them alive or didn't, you know, because they had a chance at an education. They were able to use the skills that they had to improve their lives. And um, so really, really love that job. Um, I've worked in government, um, helped support local businesses, especially like local manufacturing businesses um, in Nigeria, I've also, I worked in DC for a while, um, doing a lot of work with African gov governments there and African consulates working on trade promotion um, for African industries with um, US entities on the other side. And right now I work for a family foundation here in Toronto, serving uh, different communities across Canada, including formerly incarcerated individuals, um, the Scarborough area, uh, rural Newfoundland and um, Labrador. Um, newcomer refugees to Canada, um, essentially people where um, the system does have supports for them, but then there's a gap yes. um, where they really start to fall through the cracks. And so my organization really tries to find individuals who are on the ground um, doing work already to serve these amazing people with mm -hmm. so much potential. And, and, and I, I like to think of us as like jet fuel to the work that they're doing. You know, we, we don't know what the solution is and we can't fix um, we can't fix people, well, nobody can fix people, but right. um, essentially just finding those that are really doing the work that counts and the work that winds up being incredibly impactful and transformative and helping them just do that better um, on a larger scale. And there's just been so much learning in that process for me with regards to human capacity for excellence and, and purpose. And I've got to meet some really amazing individuals who you know, six years ago had the, you know, had the, the comprehensive capabilities of like a 12 year old as, as adults due to like, you know, the trauma and experiences they'd had in life. And, yes. and now are, you know, homeowners and business managers. Um, another individual that, um, that I heard a lot about um, was non-communicative um, back when she was a ward of the state um, and the institutions mm -hmm. and, um, now through like receiving supports from um, different from the organizations really doing the grunt work, um, she's now a store manager. She's talking. She's communicating. She's you know her the experiences that she had leading to where she was no longer define who she is, and mm -hmm. she's found um, purpose and meaning um, in her life. And so just being able to be a part of that journey because I think a lot of times we've had we really like drilled down society to certain. I think markers that we look for that we like to think tell us what the potential of an individual is or mm -hmm. what will solve their problem. You know, like poverty, for instance, is the absence of money, but poverty itself is not a problem. It's a symptom of a greater problem. Yes. Um, you know, within so, uh, social interactions and, and, and so um, societal constructs. And so giving someone that's poor money um, might help in the short run, but doesn't necessarily solve the problems that they face. Um, and then similarly, for instance, from our um, formerly incarcerated portfolio, I just came back from a, from a trip, a work trip um, with organizations working in that space. You know, what we're hearing from the ground is mm -hmm. giving people jobs and giving them homes, though very helpful for them to have a shelter and for them to have access to income. It, it, it does make a huge difference in their lives. But if you really want to see transformation mm -hmm. in their lives and you really see want to see individuals go from surviving to thriving mm -hmm. it's that community connection it's showing them love yeah. it's teaching them to trust themselves yes it's um really helping them see that they as they are are you know worthy loved accepted there are people in the community that take them as they are that accept them that that look out for them when they don't show up 
And as, as people really start to step into the safety of community and mm-hmm. communal relations, um, you just see them take off for the hills. And you know, if you, th- if you think about you know, getting housing security and getting jobs, it's almost like a linear progression. But the yes. minute you throw in that communal aspect, it's just this exponential growth in, um, in their development and, and in their potential. And, and you know, those are the things that are harder to measure. How do you, how do you prove that the community and, and a sense of belonging in community is really what helps people thrive? That's, you know, there's no numbers. Safe. And exactly, there's yeah. no numbers to demonstrate yeah. that. But that actually is what unlocks um, really unmeasurable potential yes. in, in individuals and then in society as a whole right across the board. So basically, um, in a nutshell, what you're doing is healing people. I'm, I'm not healing. No, no, why I say <laughs> that is because you're providing a platform for them to be able to grow as an individual, but you're also helping them to provide community, which that love and that support. Growing as an individual is one thing, but having that community, you feel safe. Yep. You know, so honestly, um, so it's funny because on the podcast, we are having a section where we will be speaking to holistic healers. But what you have been doing with your organization, by the way, if you don't mind telling us, what is the name of the organization that you uh, work for? The North Pine Foundation. North Pine Foundation? Yep. Okay. And if they anyone wanted to look um, look them up online, is there a website? Yes. Uh, www.northpinefoundation.ca. Okay. <laughs> Keeping it simple. <laughs> So let's get back to the topic on hand. We'll be talking about uterine fibroids, and you are no <laughs> no newbie when it comes to that. Now, what? tell our listeners when you first started experiencing the symptoms of fibroids. Oh, good heavens. Um, this is actually a great story. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in Nigeria at that time working... Um, well, I'd, I'd gone back to Nigeria to reconnect with family, and, and I was working at that time in political communications, and um, I had met an individual, a quite fetching young man, and we went out on a date together. Mm-hmm. It was a Sunday. We went out on um, we went out on a date on Sunday and had a great time, and um, I dropped him off at home and drove home, and then about an hour after I got home, I started to feel just immense pain Mm -hmm. in my lower back and I couldn't explain what it was and I couldn't get comfortable and I remember waking my mother up and saying I'm very uncomfortable I have this pain it's not going away um can you help me and she took out some um like a medicated balm um a numbing cream and and massaged it into my back and it it didn't work it didn't help Mm. um I just I couldn't sleep that whole night all of the next day there was no comfortable position and so went to WebMD as, in, as, as everybody does <laughs> these days. And I was Googling my symptoms. What is this, you know, unending pain in my lower back? And, and I saw some article about maybe it's because my jeans were too tight um, and because apparently tight jeans cause back pain or something. Um, but I just, I just was miserable and I'd been on painkillers all day and nothing was working. And so um, one of my family members worked at that time. She was... Um, she ran the kitchen in a hospital, mm-hmm. and I asked her if she could talk to one of the doctors and see um, if they had any advice for me or if they could you know, tell me something to just pick up at the pharmacy. I wasn't wanting to go to the hospital at mm-hmm. all to get any help, but it had been, at that point, um, two straight days with no ability to rest or stop, just immense pain. Well, well, two days without sleep, but a full about 24 hours of like you know, never-ending mm-hmm. pain, and I was absolutely miserable. And... Um, my cousin's wife didn't see my message till she got home, and when she found me, she said I was gray, and I, I don't quite understand how I can be gray, but um, <laughs> according to her, I was really quite gray, and mm-hmm. my pallor wasn't right, and um, to great complaints from me, she bundled me in the car and rushed me to the hospital immediately, uh-huh. and they threw me into the ER immediately, and were like, you're not well, we're not sure what it was. Um, immediately, they put... Um, an IV line in mm-hmm. um, with painkillers and then started just a barrage of tests trying to figure out what was going on with me. And um, and you weren't having any bleeding at this time? Um, no, no bleeding. But part of the issue, oh, well, not quite issue, but I'd been on, um, I had uh, Mirena mm-hmm. IUD in at that time. Mm-hmm. And so um, 
I would have periods of spotting and whatnot, but I, I, I didn't have, because of the progesterone and the Mirena, I didn't have regular periods. Right. So I didn't, I couldn't observe um, what my um, bleeding was like or what my spotting was like. Okay. But as they ran tests, um, one of the things that came up almost immediately was that the volume of blood in my body was dangerously low. I had about 30% of the amount of, of blood that I should have had um, in my body then in Nigeria and they said, you know, we needed to give you a blood transfusion. Now I'm a child of the nineties, right? Yes. Like I was, I was born in the eighties, but really came into like, you know, cognitive, um, yeah. <laughs> a, a knowledge are. of the world <laughs> and a worldview in the nineties. And, and, you know, growing up in the early to mid nineties with the reality of HIV and AIDS mm -hmm. all around and mm -hmm. knowing, you know, how in the early days we didn't know how it was spread. And so a lot of innocent people were, you know, getting, um, we're getting the disease, getting the virus mm -hmm. through shared needles, um, even within like hospital um, units where, you know, if, if the if the instruments weren't properly sterilized, um, people were getting sick that way or through blood transfusions. And I was this incredibly uncouth. And like, like I remember looking at the doctor and just being mortified and saying, I'm so sorry to do this because <laughs> I know I'm going to yeah. sound like yeah. that obnoxious, ignorant tourist. Mm -hmm. Like, but I don't know that I can take a blood transfusion. <laughs> I mean, no, especially in Africa. I'm <laughs> terrified. <laughs> and I come home, but and I'm he's not like, home. <laughs> "What are you talking about? Yeah. The blood is clean. We know what's." And I'm like, "Look, I know." And I'm yeah. like, "I, I feel awful. Yeah. I feel really, truly awful." But especially, you know, like this was the part that the the doctor didn't understand. I think if I grew up in Nigeria, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. But growing up in Zambia, AIDS was a pandemic yes. in Zambia when I grew up there, and through many years of my life in Zambia, every week, someone I knew and someone in my in, in our in our mm -hmm. social circle had a relative that was dying of AIDS and HIV. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched um, a dear family friend really just wither away in front of us um, because she got the the virus from a philandering husband, um, and so there was just a real fear of like I know people. I, I wasn't like I wasn't accusing them of <laughs> um, ill intention. Mm -hmm. It's just I just I'd seen too many people um, be affected by the disease by like no wrongdoing of their own. Yes, you know they, yes. they, they were not being promiscuous. They were trying to get the health care that they needed, and I just was like, God, I, 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 no, no. That, mm. and Honestly, <laughs> don't feel embarrassed by that because um, about two years ago I was in the hospital. And that was one of the things that they had to do was, we have to give you a blood transfusion, you've lost too much blood. And I was just remembering that, I think even 10 years ago, uh, a mutual friend of Lara and mine, actually, she caught, she, he, she caught um, what's it called, hepatitis B, blood transfusion, mm -hmm. here in Toronto. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think, I was like, no, no, no. And he's like, they're like, no, we've done tests, we can be clean, I'm like, and I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> But I had to go through yeah. it nonetheless. So don't feel embarrassed. Yeah. I think it's worldwide. There's that fear, especially for us who did grow up in the 80s, yeah. seeing people who, who caught AIDS through AIDS, um, through blood transfusion exactly. or hepatitis B and all those things. So Yeah, yeah I think what be. really, what moved the needle for me, and this is one of the things that I think has just made me even more conscious about the struggle that women have mm -hmm. with, with uh, uterine fibroids as well as with endometriosis, was the doctor just looked at me. I, 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 ref I refused to take the transfusion for over a day. And finally, he came to me and said, there is not enough blood in your body. Oh and your heart is struggling to make sure yep. that all of your organs and all of your systems have the blood that they need. So mm -hmm. your heart is having to work so hard right now. And if you don't address that, you will you will cause permanent damage to your heart. And it's, it's like it's just a fast drain to heart disease. And so I said, OK fine you know let's do it but it was really just understanding that having them explain to me mm -hmm. not just that I needed the transfusions but that the the condition of being anemic um and, and the stress that my body was going through mm -hmm. was causing um further stress on my organs that would not just be in that moment it'd be that the impact of that would continue for the rest of my life so I did agree to get um the transfusions and then we continued to do all sorts of tests um, so many X-rays, um, a number of ultrasounds. I think they, I think there was a CT scan, not a CT scan, but a scan of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, 
eventually, uh, when they went back and did the um, ultrasound again, they went in and did a transvaginal um, ultrasound, and that's when they noticed um, the presence of the fibroids. And there was, um, I think they picked up three or four fibroids in that scan, mm -hmm. and um, they, the doctor's diagnosis then at that point was that what was likely to happen was that one of the um, fibroids had been degenerating, it was now dying, mm -hmm. and the pain yes. and the discomfort I was feeling was from the death of the, the, of the fibroid. Mm -hmm. And so I was immediately, um, I was, I was uh, told that I needed to get surgery immediately to have um, the fibroids excised so that I could um, you know, move, get back to a better quality of life. So just to be just to be clear, the one that was dying, they were going to remove that one, including or with, with the other ones, or was it the dying one? They said, okay, that's dying. It's going to calcify, and leave that alone. Or did they remove all the fibroids? Um, at that time, the intent was to remove all the fibroids because they okay. couldn't tell which one was dying, okay. but they they knew that there were multiple. So they saw three or four. They they weren't sure which one was dying, mm -hmm. um, and they said the safest thing to do was to get rid of all of them. Okay. Um, at that time, this would have been 2017. I was... I was about to ask you how old Yeah, you? I was 32 years old, okay. unmarried, no children. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the one of the cultural things that it's really just made um, places like Africa and, and, you know, in India and the Middle East just better, or, and even Turkey, better at responding to issues of um, fibroids and endometriosis in, in the female population mm -hmm. is the high value um, on children and family and um, reproduction as a whole. And mm -hmm. so I think the worry was that at my age, getting older, um, not you know, there was a concern that I wouldn't be able to have kids if we didn't do the surgery mm -hmm. um, and get my get my uterus just to a better state of general health. Um, and freaking out as as one did, and because I'd grown up in the U.S. immediately. Um, we were trying to find some possible um, hospital options in the U.S. for, mm -hmm. for surgery, looking at other places. Um, also around the world, it would be options for me, but knowing that I needed the surgery as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, yeah, we, we looked at a number of hospitals in the U.S., spoke to people who'd had surgery, that, you know, who'd had surgeries, uh, and the myomectomy, which is where the uterus is removed from the body. And um, it's like a, like a C-section, yes. but you take the uterus out and then remove... Um, all of the fibroid, uh, fibroid tumors. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we spoke to individuals that had had, especially Nigerian women that had had the surgery mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. and the ones that had had it in, in Nigeria as well. And the general consensus um, or the general messaging that I was getting back from Nigerian women that were friends of my family and friends of my friends was that um, it was actually much better to get the surgery in Nigeria um, then to get it in the U.S., the doctors were um, more familiar mm -hmm. with um, preserving just the, the, the woman's body, mm -hmm. um, preserving reproductivity, mm -hmm. um, and um, and just had higher rates of success mm. in um, dealing with um, with fibroids when it was interfering with people's lives, especially if it was caught um, in time. And so um, I think even as we continue to do research. We discovered that there was one hospital, it was, and it was a public hospital. Um, so, yeah, a public hospital run by the government, not by um, a private individual in a little town. Well, Joss isn't quite a little town, but it's Joss Plateau in, like, mid-north Nigeria that has one of the best, and I can't remember the name of the hospital, so I apologize, but it had one of the best... Um, like, success rates for the, the myomecto myomectomy surgeries. Okay. But... I did not want to have to travel for my surgery, <laughs> one. And then also, two, was not particularly excited about being in a public hospital. Right. Um, and at that point, I'd already spent about a week in the hospital with, um, as they were trying to just stabilize um, my system and trying to and, um, rebuild my immunity. And I, I had to share a ward with strangers. Um, and I was not doing well. I was crawling out of my skin. So, in other words, being in a private hospital in Nigeria obviously would have been a better option to get better care. Um, well, in, in the private hospitals, there's a better opportunity for, like, private wards. Mm -hmm. um, 
the private hospitals, some of them are quite big, it dep- and it depends on the hospital. You know, some ho- we do have um, state of the art, um, world class level private hospitals mm-hmm. across Nigeria. They're just way more expensive than yes. the public than the public hospital. But this particular public hospital had a really high rate of success with myomectomy surgeries. But I made the decision not to go there. Um, I wanted to stay at the hospital that I was at and with mm-hmm. the doctors that I'd worked with. I felt like I'd developed a good rapport with them. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I think was also quite challenging for me, and hopefully my parents never see this podcast, (laughs) um, was, yeah, I did have, I did have Mirena. I had an IUD inside of me. Um, I had had a few instances earlier where I was needing um, medical care Mm -hmm. and doctors had heard um, as they went through my file, they discovered I had the Mirena and, um, and they saw that I was unmarried. Um, and immediately just denied me access to care. I think the assumption was they just automatically assumed I was a slut, harlot, loose woman, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and no, you know, at no point did they ask why I why I was on yes. it and and what purpose it served. Um, they just, you know, like I'd go in and I had a serious condition that mm-hmm. needed to be served, and they'd be like, "Take a painkiller and vitamin C." So, <laughs> when they saw that. So backtracking a bit, when you had the Mirena put in, was it put in when you were in the States? Yep. or what? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, it was put in when I was in the States, and I'm, I'm really grateful for um, the Affordable Care Act mm-hmm. um, that came through in the U.S. because that meant that I was able to get the Mirena for free. And at, um, thanks to the Obama administration, prior to that, okay. it would have been, it would have cost so much money mm-hmm. um, to get access to that. And... Um, I wasn't very good with um, with the pills. I don't like taking medication mm-hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister also was an athlete and needing being able to regulate her um, hormones um, and it affected her performance as an athlete. Yes. And so this was something that she she needed for her own just uh, professional athletic career. And as I saw her kind of work through those decisions on her own, I was like, well, you know, it makes sense for me to get this too. Um, and I didn't know what my future held, and I knew like I wasn't planning on having kids in the next five years. Mm-hmm. So it, it made sense for me to just take this as a precaution, especially as a free service mm-hmm. um, at a service center, healthcare center facility that I trusted. Um, so yeah, I had I got that in the U.S. But when I was in Nigeria, you know, I I mentioned it to the doctors, and at that time I also kind of I needed to get it out, and mm-hmm. so I was able to very secretly think I'm so grateful to the doctors. <laughs> um, they were able to extract it for me okay. um, without the knowledge of my family members. Yes. Um, and, and just they, they protected my privacy good, in that good. way, which was immense. Um, also, they told, they told me while they took it out, it was quite hard for them to find it because it had traveled up and like lodged into one of my fallopian tubes. And oh yeah, so gosh. it took a bit of work for them to find it. But I was like, thank you. You found it. You took it out. But So, so wait a minute. It, it, fa- it found its way up into your, your fallopian tubes. Yeah. So that would have caused infertility issues right away. You could have lost yeah. your fallopian tubes. Yep. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, thankfully that didn't happen. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. Thankfully um, that didn't happen. But so, um, yeah. So I wound up. I think it was a week later. Scheduled my surgery. Went in. It was meant to be an hour long surgery. I wound up being in the OR for five hours. Um, and um, my family was just incredibly concerned. Yeah. Um, I have no. Recolle- I just just like there's like misty wafts of, of, of what occurred over yes. the next like 24 to 48 hours because I was very very um, heavily sedated um, but essentially when I when I came to and started thinking uh, more like a regular human the doctor said they'd found 19 um, fibroids on my uterus and not the three or four that they yeah. initially assumed um, which is why the surgery took much longer um, than expected um, that tends to be a common story among, among yeah. women that you, they see one thing with the ultrasound, and then when they go in, they see way more. So much more, yep. So um, this is some thoughts that's coming through my mind. So you were on the Mirena. Mirena, how long were you on the Mirena for? Five years at Five that years. point, yeah. And I, I'm not too sure in regards to how it works with the American system, but did they do any tests prior, or, or did they just say, okay, you want Mirena, here you go, you yep. can have it? Yeah, so I was a uni- I was a... I was, it was towards the end of my PhD program. I was a graduate mm-hmm. student. I got it at the University Healthcare Center. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there were, there were no, I mean, I ha, I would have regular um, gynecological exams, mm-hmm. but at that point in your youth, like no one's doing ultrasounds, mm-hmm. right? Uh, women's bodies, no, especially black and brown women's mm-hmm. bodies, you know, they go in and do the pap smear and, you know, that comes out clean, you're good to go, but no one's actually 
if you're not pregnant, no one's going through really, or there isn't some sort of like critical health, pressing health issue, mm-hmm. no one's going through to see what else is happening um, in your body. And I think that's one of the things that um, really affects the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? But it, it contributes to the high rate of um, health complications around um, you know communities of color, mm-hmm. especially um especially, yeah, with fibroids and endometriosis, mm-hmm. you know, by the time we actually figure out what's going on, this is something that we may have caught before, but, yes. who, you know, who's willing to pay for um, for that maintenance and, and, and that who's willing to pay for for those preventative um, scans, you know, since, and then I'll, I'll give this as an aside, since my, um, since my, so since I had, I had my surgery in 2017, mm-hmm. when I moved, I moved to Toronto in 2018, and then in 2019, I was starting to get cramps um, in my in my abdomen, just mm-hmm. really really painful cramps. And I went to I just went to a walk-in clinic, and at that time they they assumed it was gas. They're like, oh, we think it's gas, but mm-hmm. since you've had a myomectomy before, since I'd had the surgery before, let's go in um, and get an ultrasound mm-hmm. done. And when I went in for an ultrasound, they're like, yep, fibroids are back. <laughs> you've, you've got yeah. new fibroids, yeah, especially after a myomectomy. That's yep. common. Mm-hmm. And and f- sorry, were you on any of the birth control at the time or no? Um, at that time, I um, I had gotten back on um, an IUD. So I, I'm, I have a copper IUD, um, and I had a copper IUD, and that was the only thing that I had at that point. Right. Um, and then when they discovered the... Um, when they discovered the, the fibroids, I was... Um, oh, referred to a specialist, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Stephen M., um, amazing, amazing doctor. Mm-hmm. Like he's been such a, s- a source of support for mm-hmm. me. Where does um, he practice out of? He is at uh, Bay and Bay and Gerard. Bay and College. Bay there's, College. There's, that, there's that building right in, in um, at Bay and College yes. on the southwest side. I think it's like 900 Bay or something. Oh, I know exactly. Yeah, where you're speaking. and yes. like it's mm-hmm. just all medical facilities yes. in there. Um, but yeah, no. It, at, a, at the early stages, we tried to get just an understanding of like what was going on, how bad things were. Mm-hmm. Um, he manages my care. Um, the fibroids have continued to grow in size and in number, I believe mm-hmm. now. Um, at the last count, there's five of them, but I'm gonna be getting it, um, an ultrasound again um, next month to see you know what's going on, where they are. I have different, I have, I think probably once every 18 months or so, I'll get like a really, really, um, intense ultrasound because it's on a histogram, like, um, more like that. No, uh, well, I think it's because there's different clinics that do the mm-hmm. do the ultrasounds, and some of them um, will only report back on the um, on the f- the biggest three fibroids That's that what they, they see. always do. They don't report yes. back on the rest of them. No, they don't. Um, there's a few other clinics and imaging centers. I should call them imaging centers that will report back on all of the fibroids, um, and so um, I most of the time go to the ones that just do the top three because the results come out immediately. Yes. Um, and I can go back and like, I'll go get, I'll usually my, I spend all morning at the doctors. I get, mm. the, I get the ultrasound done and then I go to the doctor's office and you know, we talk about what's going on with my body and how things have been over the next six months. Mm-hmm. And he asks me when on earth I'm going to get married and have kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah <that's> um, <laughs> because that's, that's what we're doing right yeah, now yeah, is trying to keep everything preserved. in check. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and he's like, have you met anyone? And I'm like, well, is your son available? Because, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, he's much too young for me. <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. I find it frustrating as a woman myself who has fibroids and who has a lot. And they always focus on the main three. And I kept saying to them, oh, you know, can you look at the other ones that are there? And they say, oh, oh, too many fibroids, too many fibroids. No point looking at them. And I'm like really this could actually be causing me more harm yeah. because you can't see them until you go in for surgery. So um, there's something I want to ask, and this is something that I know, and I'm just speaking from my own personal experience, with being, like for me, I can't be on any pills or the uh, Mirena or Eric, copper IUDs, nothing, because the hormones causes my fibroids to grow more. Is this something that the doctor had mentioned to you at all or no? Um, so we're not sure if the progesterone and the Mirena affected my, you know, either triggered the fibroids okay. or, or made them grow larger or whatever. I did mm-hmm. have the Mirena at the point that I had surgery. 
Um, part of why I went with the copper mm -hmm. was even though I know that it, for many women it comes with you know a heavier period yes. and heavier bleeding um, and stronger cramps, it, it doesn't come with any hormones. So my body and my hormonal, uh, my hormonal levels should be what they are normally. Okay. Um, and so with the copper as it was, my body was still producing um, fibroids. Yes. Um, what the what the doctor wind up wound up doing was um, putting me on um, some pretty strong um, hormone blockers, essentially, and, mm -hmm. and my reproductive system is all but shut down. Um, at the moment, I refer to it as chemical menopause. Yes, um, yes, I know someone is going through. Yeah, that, and so when I got on the really, um, I think it was probably. For three or four months, I was on Orlissa, mm -hmm. I think Orlissa, mm -hmm. and, um, and there was something else that I was on, um, and now I'm just on low, low to maintain um, what all of the blockers, the you know the stronger blockers had done initially. Um, what I have noticed is, um, and this like, they, yes, they are more fibroids. Sometimes they're a little bit bigger. Sometimes they're a little bit smaller. Um, in terms of looking at like patterns in my life. And what's going on? I, I notice that they tend to be bigger when I'm going through periods of higher stress. stress yes. So when I'm absolutely miserable in life for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you know, you know, trying to find a job in Toronto <laughs> first is not mm -hmm. great. Um, during those periods, then yeah. yeah, they they're a little bit bigger. Things are not looking quite so great. Mm -hmm. um, when things start to settle down in my life, they might be just a fraction smaller. Okay. Um, they're not. They're not big enough right now or numerous enough for surgery at the moment. Okay. And if I wasn't working to preserve um, what fertility I have, if mm -hmm. any, then um, we would, um, you know, then I, I wouldn't be on the pills at all. Right. Um, I, like, I'll be honest, I absolutely loathe medication. Mm -hmm. I, I hate yeah. that I have to take these pills mm -hmm. um, every day. Um, and within my family, um, I'm. We do have a high rate of. Um, well, I, I have a number of cousins that have had fibroids, mm -hmm. um, and ovarian cysts of, of different kinds. Yeah. Um, some of whom had been infertile till they were able to get the surgery, and that let them have kids. But I have other family members that have um, ovarian cysts that have made them completely infertile, and the location of the cysts is such that if surgery was done. Um, they would actually be infertile. So the cysts can be removed, um, but they're also, like, it's, it's castrating too. There's nothing. Tubes. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's on the fallopian tubes right in front of the ovaries on both sides blocking. Yep. Um, so um, I, I, wor I wonder about um, if perhaps this is it's a genetic thing or not. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's a lot of conditional issues and environmental issues and, and sadly, we know so much about erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. um, and we have medications to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But so much about fibroids is is up in the air. We use we use statistics like thirty to eighty percent of women have fibroids. What the hell does that mean? Yes. Those yeah. those are huge, very very disparating numbers. We do know that we see um, exponentially more cases of fibroids, especially with um, debilitating um, health impacts on women of color, yes. black women. Brown women. Yes. Um, I know that there's been some discourse about perhaps for um, uh, relaxers being a cause mm -hmm. of fibroids in the black female population. And in, in societies like the U.S., that might make sense. But we do have high rates of fibroids in African communities mm -hmm. and in rural areas as well where you don't see um, quite as much use of um of hair relaxers yes, yeah. or in the Indian community where you don't see quite as much use of hair relaxers. Yeah, so, like that. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I might say, I'm not saying that necessarily, mm -hmm. I mean, they have different, if it's a the lie, yeah, yeah. they might mm -hmm. be different, you know, we're exposed to different sorts of chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, and even, and if, if you, if you look at that too, then I think about, well, on the other side, I, I look at, um, for instance, um, Caucasian women who also expose themselves to all sorts of chemicals mm -hmm. um, for beauty products and tanning and, and whatnot and you know and their nails and getting perms and and bleaches and like th there's so much chemicals that we expose ourselves to um, but we, we 
we know what's carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. We know what causes um, certain things, but for some reason, no one's just done the work to figure out is there actually a correlation um, between certain kinds of chemicals mm -hmm. and, um, and the occurrence of fibroids. You know, yes, black women will, as a population, generally use relaxers more than other um, other populations will because that's a product that's made specifically for them. Right. But if black women also are having fibroids, that doesn't necessarily mean that the relaxers are causing the fibroids. Is it? It could be. We don't know. But that just the amount of time and research that it takes to study that hasn't been done. You know, we, if you think about it um, from a different perspective, you know, like it's, um, I'm trying to think of like what other, there's just, there's, there's a number of other like health concerns. You know, we think about mortality rates, for instance, um, amongst um, black women in the US, not, this is not the most direct correlation, um, but why do we have exponentially higher rates of um, maternal mortality in the US yep. amongst black women um, than we do amongst white, you know, amongst white women or, exactly. or, or groups, other um, other racial groups yes. um, in the U.S. There is there's something at work that's not being studied, that's not being addressed. But even if you even if you go back to that, let's you know, let's not put the racial lens on that. Maternal mortality in the U.S., for instance, is ridiculous for a country of its wealth mm -hmm. and development. It makes the the, the rates. Their, their, their maternal mortality rates make no sense mm -hmm. um, for where they should be as a nation. And th these are things that need to be addressed. Um, but again, the things we care about, Viagra yeah. Yeah. <laughs> extends. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for, I am incredibly happy that there is all of these services geared towards men um, and healthcare geared towards men. And that, that's, that makes sense. Um, because yeah, family. Mem I have family members, for instance, that have that have had prostate cancer mm -hmm. or have had all of these other health issues. But we're still making diagnoses or attempting to understand um, the basic health care and welfare of women, mm -hmm. um, and especially Black women, based on norms and standards of what is typical for white men. Yeah. And those numbers don't tell the same truth. You know, you. you and, and when you look at it, you think about things like um, anemia, for instance, mm -hmm. right? For example, blacks in general tend to be more, more anemic, anemic. Mm -hmm. than whites. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't actually tell us. It's, it's just that's comparative, right? right. So that the, the, but the numbers, because the numbers we have are for this population. Now, all of a sudden, we're casting aspersions on another population mm -hmm. saying, well, you're anemic. You don't have enough blood or whatever. Um, or and, and well, not even not even just you don't have enough. You're anemic, mm -hmm. um, and if you think about how that continues to play out in life, right? So um, I'm lucky to have um, a job that affords me benefits, yes, um, including um, long-term disability. But me being anemic, mm -hmm. based on being compared to a man's biology, mm -hmm. and worse yet, a white man's biology, mm -hmm. means that I'm not eligible for extended long-term disability, even though the rest of my health markers um, are you know, positive and in the clear. Yes. And the insurance agency is like, well, yeah, I eh, can't do it. And I'm like, no, but can you tell me what the typical um, blood test rates, what, what are the norms for black women? Exactly. We, as a society, if this was 50 years ago, no problem, I get it. You probably didn't have access to that many black women. Every time we go into all of these hospitals, St. Michael's, uh, Scarborough, St. Joe's, wherever, every time we go into the hospital, they're drawing blood, they're taking, um, they're taking, you know, tests, doing all of these things. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that we don't have enough samples in any of these hospitals, or actually across all of them, to start to understand what the normal levels are, for instance, mm -hmm. um, for different sets of populations, so that we can actually provide them with the care that they need mm -hmm. based on what their reality is and not what the reality is for a, a, a smaller subset of the population or just a certain subset of the population. Mm -hmm. You cannot gauge me or diagnose me based on the experiences of a body that's entirely foreign and different to mine. Bone density, different. Muscle mass, different. Mm -hmm. um, weight, different. Yes. Height, different. Body needs, different. You know, metabolic body. rate, yeah, different. Exactly. That, 
that body does not function as my body does. Mm-hmm. And to expect my body to function in the way Same that that body that. does, oh. like, are you kidding? And then we put these markers on and say, no, your body should do this. And then when you layer onto that all of the other social stresses that um, that people face, especially black women mm-hmm. face within the socioeconomic strata of society, um, a lot of the microaggressions, um, systemic injustices, mm-hmm. call them, you know, call it systemic racism, whatever words you want mm-hmm. to use. Um, it's just so much harder. And all of these things on a day-to-day basis don't really count. Right. But if you th- think about it as a beach, for instance, if you mm-hmm. use, the, use the beach as the imagery, right? And every day the tide comes in and the water takes away just a couple grains of sand. Mm-hmm. And you don't miss it. It's still lovely. It's gorgeous. You can take romantic walks down the beach and the water lapping at your feet. But all of a sudden, 10 years later, you look back and half of the beach is gone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 12 years later, there is no beach. Mm-hmm. You thought you built your house on solid ground. Oh, wow, biblical references. <laughs> you know, you thought, yeah. you, thought mm-hmm. you built your house on solid yes. ground, yeah. and now the ocean's lapping at your door. Yeah. And your house, your home that was not even at, on the beach, your home that was further away, mm-hmm. is being washed into the water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But why are we not paying attention when the few grains of sand are, are pulling back, right? Why are we not paying attention or even trying to understand what is going on here? That way, if we do actually want to one stay and live here, mm-hmm. you you know you can build out because beaches are rebuilt every you know everywhere. We have the technology. We have the technology to save human lives. We mm-hmm. have the technology to make sure that there isn't food insecurity across. We build, we we manufacture more than enough food um, for the world population as it stands. Mm-hmm. We have the technology to make sure that people have access to greater uh, social determinants of health, mm-hmm. but we don't do it, and for for multiple reasons. And then you look at like a, a community like here in Canada, where, for instance. Um, or I should say here in Ontario, we have this fairness clause in our healthcare system Mm -hmm. where every community is expected to raise a certain percentage of their um, healthcare needs Mm -hmm. for the the government to then invest in their local healthcare network. So looking at, um, I don't know if you've been aware of the the Love Scarborough um, campaign from the Scarborough Health Network. Mm -hmm. Um, Over the last 20 years, the government of Ontario has invested zero dollars into any capital um, projects in the Scarborough Health Network. Every other network within the greater GTA region um, mm-hmm. health network has received funding from the government because they do, they have a higher tax base. But because the community in Scarborough is not able to raise Mm-hmm. that money because they don't have the disposable income exactly um, for that even though and we don't talk about right the things that are causing um, lack of access to disposable income mm-hmm. um, we're letting there's nothing wrong with you know the, the market economy and letting um, foreign investors come in and purchase property that's it's part of like putting money back within our economy but what's happening is that um, we have these all of these properties in downtown Toronto mm-hmm. that are not inhabited. People are trying to make a quick buck. The, the cost of housing is increasing left, right, and center. And so now we have families in Scarborough paying <laughs> what individuals are paying in downtown Toronto. And yeah, it might be a little bit cheaper in Scarborough, but it's still really expensive. It is. It is. And people cannot afford to live mm-hmm. and put food on the table. So where are they supposed to find the money to pay for the hospital? Meanwhile, mm-hmm. the same individuals, just so we're all on the same page yes. of equality, the same individuals are also paying their taxes, right? So, Because mm-hmm. we're not saying they're not paying their taxes. They are paying their taxes. They're contributing their, um, to the local, um, to the gov- to local government's um, revenues mm-hmm. based on the rates that we've decided that apply to everybody. They pay the same taxes everybody else is paying. Mm-hmm. Why do they not have access to better health care? And then when the stresses of that show up, Mm -hmm. because the ERs are overcrowded, the rooms are overcrowded, the ORs are overcrowded, and that shows up in their lives, and we're starting to notice, oh, no, Scarborough, for instance, has a really high rate of um, kidney disease, highest rate of kidney disease in North America. Um, We don't even know how many women 
have fibroids because who has the time to sit and wait for hours to get access to primary health care? No, they're basically saying who, that they have no time. Who even has a GP? A lot of people are in need for GPs, yes. And, a lot and, that's, not, and that's not just a yeah. Scarborough problem. Yeah. Yeah. Friends yeah. that live here in downtown Toronto do not have, have been waiting for years for mm -hmm. a GP. And if you don't have a GP, no one's actually tracking what's, because I think this is, it's been interesting to think about this, because the GP model, right, was you had a doctor, and that doctor followed you through your life. Yes. So that even if you lost track of the things that were important, or you, you, you forgot to mention to the doctor that you were feeling some sort of way, mm -hmm. the next time you show up at your visit, the doctor might say, you're looking kind of gaunt, mm -hmm. or you're looking heavier. What's going on with you? They can ask you and check in with you. Yeah and make sure everything's okay. Exactly. And that way, they're able to catch um, any major diseases or any major changes in your health in your health and in your body mm -hmm. early on and get you the care and the treatment that you need. But if people don't have access to that, they only show up to the hospital when they have no other option. And oftentimes, it's way too late. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. way too late at that point. And we keep, you know, these are, I think for me what's gutting is it's not that we don't know. Mm -hmm. We know and we do nothing. And then that's really frustrating for me. And so um, one of the things that I was super grateful for about the work that I do is um, working with the North Pine Foundation, we were able to um, make, make a capital investment in Scarborough Healthcare um, in the Scarborough Health Network. Okay. And as a result of that, it, our investment provoked other um, private funders and philanthropists within the GTA to invest money as well, and it unlocked um, a significant amount of money from the government. Um, and for Scarborough, it was the size of that investment was um, the biggest thing they'd had, and like they just were dumbfounded; they hadn't expected right. that amount of of capital. Um, and I think. For, It was it was really great to see how I got things like kicked off for them. And, you know, I there's a part of me that's like, well, you know, um, but like when other funders <laughs> came on board after us, they mm -hmm. were giving even more than we gave um, to because the health network. Yeah. 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 And all of a sudden people started talking about what's going on. And the, the, the team at the hospitals in Scarborough mm -hmm. are so invested in their communities. They mm -hmm. are working above and beyond. And even just with the work that we were able to do and the brief conversations that we had to really help provide them with the momentum that they need to better serve their community, mm -hmm. um, I was able to have a conversation with doctors about fibroids and women and women's reproductive care and mm -hmm. saying, what are we doing about this? How are we like, it makes no sense to me that we know what fibroids are mm -hmm. um, and women go get care, you know, as they need to. But we're not, there's not like, there's not a, prov there's not a policy for preventative scanning for um, fibroids. Um, how are we informing people and making them aware? Like it, it felt, I didn't know about fibroids till I got sick. Same and now thing. every time mm -hmm. I talk to all of my friends and if you're going, I'm like, if you're going in for annual exam, especially as, as we get older, so my friends that are over the age of 30, I'm like, if you're going in for your annual exam or you're going in to see um, for your pap smear or whatever, ask for an ultrasound. Ask, especially you know, to, to friends of mine that are um, black and brown, I'm like, ask for an ultrasound. Ask them to take, a, to take a picture to see what's going on in your body so you have the information and you can start keeping a record of that. What you're saying is so crucial because I could never understand, especially for a population that has a high rate, I mean, women in general, we need to get tested um, prior to. Yeah. Even prior to being on certain type of birth controls to know that which birth control will actually be beneficial for yep. you. I was on the pill for many years and this was just to be able to regulate my period, but not knowing that it was causing my fibroids to grow and I didn't even know I had fibroids. These To be able to get yourself assessed and I find also that when they do assess and they see, oh, you have fibroids, sometimes they just watch it until it gets to the extreme. Mm. And then by that time, you know, you either have to go for surgery or you're not even a candidate for surgery. Um, but uh, that on, on the side, I want to know what community supports you find has help, been helpful for you. I know you mentioned about your doctor, and that's amazing that you have a doctor that's been so supportive. 
but like any type of community support. I remember you mentioned to me um, a few. Uh, one was Nancy's Nook. How yeah. have you found that was beneficial for you? So um, Nancy's Nook is a is a commun- an online community on mm-hmm. Facebook um, that's actually for endometriosis and not for fibroids. Mm-hmm. But as I was trying to understand what was going on in my body, um, especially post-surgery, what the healing process would look like. I'd, I'd never had any major health, like I'd never broke a bone before that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All of a sudden I have this huge gash in my core and things that I didn't have to think about doing before, um, I, I wasn't even able to do anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I was trying to find just some place where there'd be some sort of understanding where mm-hmm. people were talking about you know, what was going on. And it was quite clear that... Um, Fibroid, uterine, uterine fibroids is not endometriosis, but I really found the Nancy's Nook group um, very supportive and yes. very helpful, um, very informative. And one of the things that they also did is because a lot of when women oftentimes present in hospitals, especially women of color and black mm-hmm. women, um, stating that, you know, the symptoms that they have, the issues that they have, there's an assumption that it's exaggerated or it's not as bad as mm-hmm. they claim that it is. Um, and so people don't take them seriously. Yes. And for a lot of women suffering with endometriosis, which is a debilitating disease, you know, people aren't listening to them. They're not getting the help that they need to have this taken care of. Um, and as I was trying to find um, some sort of understanding of like where I would get the supports that I needed um, here in Canada and where also um, I could um, you know, get a second opinion if I needed one, I stumbled across this group. And, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about the Nancy's Nook group is that they have in different communities, you know, a list of doctors um, that are more receptive. um, And when I say more receptive, I mean, they listen, doctors that listen to what women are going through. Um, And even just, I mean, I think there was a a situation recently, I think in in the group where um, there was a woman that had um, presenting with multiple like health issues, and um, she'd had surgery scheduled by one of the doctors um, on Nancy's Nook, and um, her OBGYN had said, "Oh, you have this other thing, and that doctor can take care of that too." And the OBGYN's not been in her body; is not in, like not aware of what's going on with her. And when she told the the surgeon and said, "You know, c- can you just do this?" Because the other doctor said you could, he was like, "No." Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. you know, this is what I do. This is what I do well. Also, with the amount of stress that your body is going under, mm-hmm. I don't recommend that you do this now. And I remember there being a lot mm-hmm. of conversation around it and, you know, and people feeling that, especially because the, the one individual felt like maybe the doctor was, you know, not as kind or as harsh. Right. But, like, to have doctors say no, mm-hmm. you know, either no, they don't know how to do it as opposed to just, you know, taking a risk on your health care mm-hmm. or two that it's not the right thing to do at that time like even just that the power of no um with someone that's informed about your condition yes. as opposed to no where they're just writing you off and there's no because you know when when she came and she said well he said no um the doctor got back in the platform and, and said this is what happened and this is exactly why I said no. It wasn't just I'm not listening to you. I'm writing you off. Right. Um, I know there's a smaller community of um, Canadian women. I think there's another Facebook group for Canadian women that deal with endometriosis. And there's a few um, hospitals um, around the world that they go to. I know there's one in Romania that they go mm-hmm. to to get the, the care that they need. Um, there's another there's a Nigerian doctor um, that um, practices both in Nigeria and in the U.K. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of women have talked about like how he's been very helpful um, in helping them um, just even getting their yes. condition diagnosed um, and getting the support that they need. Um, and this doctor, he does he focuses only on endometriosis or is also uterine fibroids? Um, he's a surgeon. I mm-hmm. think it's, it's generally just women's issues. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that was my understanding mm-hmm. of his, um, the extent of his practice. He was in a different, he was in a different city mm-hmm. um, to the one that I was in in Nigeria but again it was as, as people talked about the, the care and support they got from him um, it echoed what I'd been hearing when I was first trying to uh, make a decision as to where I was going to get mm-hmm. my surgery that just the doctors from um, an African background or um, an Indian or Middle Eastern background yes. some tip well non-western doctors from a non-western background Mm -hmm. tend to be more understanding more accommodating and even just more knowledgeable about what they're dealing with um and i think you know again it's 
the flip side of this mm -hmm. is that I think that in, in some communities and in some cultures, the expression of um, the value of women within those cultures centers around you know, what they bring to the family and their reproductive ability. Um, and that can, at times, have a negative expression mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know, viewing women as property and as chattel. And, um, you know, in, and in some cases, women might not have access to the rights that they're deserving of. But um, the flip side of that coin is that if the woman's worth and value is in her reproductive ability, mm -hmm. then the health of her uterus <laughs> winds up becoming a priority for the healthcare exactly. system. Exactly. Um, because that's important to those families and to those cultures. See, it's amazing to see the difference between culturally um, understanding fertility. Like they have that here, but I don't find they really honor that. Mm -hmm. I find that if you see have a gyneco gynecologist and you want to go for surgery and to preserve your uterus, they always say it's best that you see um, a, a reproductive specialist to be able to complete your surgery instead of a regular gynecologist yeah. because a gynecologist will just focus on the tumors. You use you lose your uterus. You don't. It doesn't matter. But at least with a reproductive specialist, they'll say, okay, a fertility specialist, sorry, mm -hmm. to correct myself. They would say, okay, this person wants to have a child. Let me try to preserve it at all costs. Yeah. Um, you were never... Um, the, well, that, but that distinction is not made, right? So no. my gynecologist wasn't separate to my fertility specialist. My gynecologist... As we as we met, mm -hmm. especially like around my surgery, mm -hmm. um, and the surgeon that that, um, that operated on me, the conversation was around um, the health of my womb and of my body, and then also my ability to be able to re reproduce. I didn't have to go to a, a second person. Exactly. Um, that's there the was just difference. you know yeah there was just that understanding um, of that mm -hmm. right and and understanding that um, I think yeah again just because of the 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 cultural values. Um, everybody's kind of working towards that shared goal, right? And I think, because one of the problems you might, you, you often have in healthcare is as um, medical professionals continue to just really specialize and they get really, really good mm -hmm. at the specific things that they do, um, that specialization can cause some of these um, just new gaps in the system, right? Mm -hmm. Because if he's a surgeon that's just good at excising um, whatever they're trying to remove from, you know, wherever, um, and they don't, you know, they might not have all of the understanding of what it would take to maintain mm -hmm. and retain um, fertility, or they might they might still have it because they're all, you know, all, all medical professionals are expected mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. at least the core knowledge of the medical profession, um, but that might not be their priority. But we're talking about cultures where all of these things are all part of the decisions that the doctors are making, right? right. So they're looking at. How do we save your life? How do we keep you in the best health? And um, and especially if you're a young woman, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that you are able to reproduce and, and do all of these other things that you want to do? And you know, and even now, I, I think about myself in my mid thirties, um, on medication, still trying to take a, take care of my body mm -hmm. in case um, there's a potential for geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of us are Ooh. there. <laughs> what they call you know. geriatric pregnancy, but it's, not sure. You yeah. know, not sure yeah. I'd survive it. But yeah. like being able to do that, um, I think is something that's that's important to me. And, and yes. you see, you see a lot of women because once you do get in the group chats and then you start hearing about how people are um, have been dealing with fibroids. And, um, and endometriosis for as, as well over a long period of time. For a lot of women, um, again, due to just lack of understanding of the disease, the decision was um, hysterectomies. Yes. Which for, you know, for, and the, the difference with, um, with uterine fibroids, or one of the major differences with uterine fibroids and endometriosis is fibroids are only on the uterus. Endometriosis can be on all organs, um, within the woman's body, yes. um, including um, your urinary tract and like other places within yeah, your body beyond your uterus, as exactly. well as on your uterus. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a lot of women that were suffering with endometriosis, getting a, hysteric a hysterectomy didn't solve your problem. Didn't solve the problem. If you had fibroids, yeah, that, that does take care of your problem. But I, I, I'm not saying that younger women cannot make the decision to not have children. Um, in their youth, they can, and that's their option. But the same way that it's your right to make that decision, mm -hmm. it should also be your right to um, 
to reverse the decision should you choose to. That your mm-hmm. body is is yours. Um, I, I I can't help but feel just a sense of loss for women who aren't able to make those decisions or to take them back Mm -hmm. because they've had a health condition that's not been adequately addressed and then you get to such um, an unreversible an irreversible decision like a hysterectomy um, that you know, if, <laughs> if if your muscles aren't working, if your arms aren't yeah. working, we don't cut your arm off immediately. No, we do so many other things before we, we cut off those limbs. And, um, it's usually and it, the first thing that's offered right? to a lot of exactly. women. A lot of women. And they think, okay, well, let me just get it done and move on. But there's but th- better even options that decision that. comes with a lot of... Yeah. There, there, there's not just the mental cost and the physical cost of, 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 the, of the surgery. There's an emotional um, yes. cost. Um to one's there's an emotional connection to yeah the universe. There is. you know and if, yeah but anyways our time is running out All so right. i just want to say Dr. Enkamp, thank you so much. You're welcome. I um, hope this was helpful. This was a wonderful. Honestly, the, all the questions I was I had to ask or even stuff I wanted to to address, you addressed it in today's podcast. Awesome. So I just want to thank you on behalf of our Freedom to Know Wellness listeners. And just to let everyone know, uh, for more extensive list of female reproductive resources, those mentioned today and other um, and more, go to our blog and newsletter at Freedom to Know Wellness at Substack.com. And subscribe to keep up to date on new podcasts and posts and what's happening on the Freedom to Know Wellness community. So as I always say, that reading information is one thing, but hearing from an individual's lived experience is another. And that's what we do here at Freedom to Know Wellness. Thanks and have a great day. To access Nancy's Nook Female Reproduction Library, go to www.nancysnookendo.com and go to their Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Nancy's Nook Endo Ed. To have your voice heard on Freedom to Know Wellness, email us at info at freedom to know wellness dot ca and follow the FTK blog at freedom to know wellness dot substack dot com and follow our our YouTube channel, Spotify, Twitter, and Instagram.